Thank you guys for coming. We're about to get started. Thanks for taking a chance on this sort of experimental performance. And thanks for those of you who are here because you loved my grandmother, Lillian. Um, to be honest, we had this concert planned before she passed because turns out today is the 273rd anniversary of when Bach dedicated this piece to the King of Prussia. And it's also Evan's 34th birthday. <laughs> but uh, I think that my grandmother would have loved this kind of concert because she was always excited about learning new things about music. Even just a few months ago, she insisted on watching a, the entirety of a two-hour master class that I gave online. And then when I would play for her afterwards, she would tell me all the new things that she could hear because of having watched the master class. So I think this is exactly the type of thing that she would have loved. So I'm going to hand it over to Evan now, our resident Bach expert scholar to tell us the story of Bach's visit to Prussia and the amazing music that it inspired. So Bach famously had um, many children and several of these children grew up to be famous composers. One of them, C.P.E. Bach, was the court composer for Frederick the Great in Potsdam. Can, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So Frederick the Great, in addition to being an expert military leader, reforming the judicial system, encouraging freedom of speech in the press, was also a great lover of the arts and science and mathematics. And there must have been some conversation between Frederick the Great and C.P.E. Bach, where C.P.E. mentioned, you know, my father could improvise complicated fugal compositions after hearing any melody, no matter how complicated, only once. And he's getting old. He's 62. <laughs> so Frederick the Great realized this might be the only time to hear the great master. So he sent an invitation to Leipzig. And Bach came to Potsdam. Now, in addition to being all these things politically, Frederick the Great was also a virtuoso flute player and an adept composer. So every night, the king would host these chamber music concerts. He would receive a list of guests for all those in attendance, who were usually some of the most brilliant thinkers from all around Europe. Famously, Voltaire came and lived with uh, Frederick the Great. So Frederick sees that Bach is in attendance at the concert, and he says, cancel everything and bring Bach to me. So Bach comes to meet Frederick the Great, and the king asks Bach to go to every single room and improvise on every single instrument. Finally, they go to the newest constructed room where the newest instrument is. It's called the piano. It can play both soft and loud, says Frederick the Great. And I have a surprise for you. And he plays a melody for Bach. Now, most of the music that Eddie will be playing tonight was composed for the flute, the king's instrument. So the king picks up his flute and he plays. <laughs> Bach sits down at this new instrument, the piano, and he improvises the most significant piano composition in history, because it was the first. Next day, 
the king invites Bach into the cathedral where he's invited the entire city to come hear the master on the organ. Now, as Bach enters the cathedral, he looks up at the architecture and he asks the king or the architect who is also in the company if they're aware of what the acoustic miracle is represented by the construction. They ask for a further explanation, so Bach earnestly begs one of the guests to go over to a remote corner of the cathedral. Bach then goes over to the opposite corner of the cathedral and whispers into the corner. And to the guest's amazement, he's able to hear perfectly every single thing Bach is whispering in a completely different part of the church. This was a man who could see acoustics and could visualize exactly the consequences of resonance. So he improvises to great acclaim for the town, and the king, in quite a dramatic gesture, removes his ring and gives it to Bach after the recital. Bach then goes back to Leipzig wearing a ring from Frederick the Great. Two months later, on July 7th, the king receives a book printed on copper plates with an inscription by Bach who says, during my visit to Potsdam, I wasn't able, due to lack of necessary preparation, to work out your royal theme to every possible musical consequence, but now, after some work, two months, here it is, in every possible conclusion, and I hope that this musical offering does your, your royal highness this very, very obsequious introduction. And he's penned the first piece, a version of that improvisation right there. What follows are then 10 puzzles for King Frederick to solve. And these puzzles are in the form of cannons. Now a cannon is a musical device like row, row, row your boat, where one person sings a melody and the other person follows with the same melody. But Bach doesn't write the second melody. He leaves clues. So the first of these cannons, the word is crab. <laughs> he writes one line of music One line of music which sounds like this. Now the solution to this canon is for me to play everything we just played backwards while Eddie plays it forwards, and then Eddie will play everything backwards while I play it forward, and the solution is the following canon. then puts the royal theme in the bass, and he has Eddie play an, <coughs> play an accompaniment on top of it. And Bach's clue for this one is unison, meaning that my right hand must play the same music as Eddie, but at the right time. And the solution is found like so.
says thank you then Bach says the royal theme doesn't need to come as a baseline it could come somewhere in the middle so now my right hand will play the royal theme Eddie will again play an accompaniment on top of it but now Bach's clue to solve this one is a strange looking clef which means that you must play the same music that Eddie plays but in a different register at still a different time. then says the royal theme has come in both the bass and in the middle, but it could also come up top. But now Bach's clue is the word inversion, meaning when my left hand enters, it's going to play the same melody that Eddie played, but inverted. So Eddie's melody goes down, my left hand will go up. all our rehearsing inside. then begins to flatter the king. And in this next one, he includes two clues. The first is the word inversion, so it will be very similar in that my two hands will now be playing against each other. He gives the melody, the royal theme, to the flute, but he also includes the mysterious phrase, as the notes began to increase, so may the fortune of the king. Now this is Bach's clue that one of the lines must be the same line, but exactly twice as long. So you'll hear a version of the royal theme played by the royal instrument, my left hand with the first canonic line, my right hand with the second canonic line upside down and twice as long. <laughs> <laughs>
the last piece of music to be composed in the musical offering is a trio sonata, and it was to be played at uh, Frederick's evening concerts. Now, a trio sonata is a sonata for two obligato instruments, in this case the flute and the violin, and the third part of the trio sonata is a collection of instruments that play the bass line. And seeing as there are neither a flute nor a violin nor a collection of instruments, Eddie will play the flute line, my right hand will play the violin line, and my left hand will play the collection of instruments that play the bass line. And, now and before we play this final part of the musical offering, I want to say one last thank you and one more huzzah for Lillian for sharing her love of music with us for so many years. You know, I grew up going to her 4th of July concerts with the New York Phil at Hexer State Park every year, and this is the closest I've ever gotten to feeling like I'm playing one of those concerts, you know, with all of you here at Fire Island and the beach. It's so something she would have loved. And uh, one last note, I thought it was kind of funny when we decided to do this here on this deck because it's a musical offering for a king, and we always called this the Doge's Palace because my grandfather Murray was the Doge of Dunewood. So it's really, I don't know, it seems fitting. Um, thank you again. <laughs>